Okay, this is the last quiz for you to get your grade up on. Anybody not turned in a get out of jail free card yet? That wants to? Okay. The work has to be completed by December 2nd. That's next Tuesday or Monday? Mm -hmm. Monday. So if you're going to do it, you have to send me a get out of jail free card. What quiz? I would caution you if you're like at a 60 and you're trying to get a better grade, if you get a worse grade, you're going to keep the worse grade. You keep the retake grade. So if you're going to have a 60 and do it over, make sure you know the bless you. Make sure you know the material well enough to get a, a higher score. Do not shoot yourself in the foot. Okay. If you don't want to use your get out of jail free card, you don't have to. Do not put your grades in jeopardy. But if you want to use it, you're welcome to do it. But you have to get it done. Obviously before the second, because it has to be turned in by the second, it has to be graded and, and, and put in the grade book by the second. So any questions about that? Does everybody have everything they owe me turned into me? I have a couple of essays I still think, but I don't know what class it's for. Okay, two quizzes left. Okay, so please get your work done. Uh, this week we're going to talk about affirmative action. We're going to segue it into John Rawls and how we level the playing field. Uh, this is all nuts and bolts, people, once again. In fact, on the quiz, you guys did really, really good, and you ladies as well. That's a generic, you guys. Uh, there's only one question. The entitlement conception of justice says that persons are entitled to enough money to live a decent quality of life. And that's supposed to be attributed to Nozick. Nozick is the one who invents the entitlement conception of justice. Make all you can, can all you get, sit on the can. You're entitled to keep everything you've made because you've worked hard for it. So if you don't work hard for it, it's not his problem. That's why this is false rather than correct. It's the only one that was below 70. Everything else looked really good. Okay. And I'm going to gather the quiz was easy enough. It was just nuts and bolts. This one I think is even easier for you. So, the reason we talk about affirmative action and diversity is because America is a unique country. This is how America has kind of grown over the years. America starts obviously as colonies, and we reject the crown, we reject the king, and now we get our freedom. So we become the land of the free and the home of the brave. And people have wanted to come here throughout our short history, continue to want to come here, because here there's something called opportunity, or at least in paper we believe that. But we also know that because now we're a diverse population, benefits are not distributed equally. And so Rawls says to us, since we all know that we're not on a level playing field, how do we go about reconciling the differences so at least we have the freedom to take advantage of opportunity in order to make wealth? So this is his solution to the level playing field. Okay. Now he acknowledges there's problems with this. Number one, he invents the equity principle. You saw this on your quiz last week. Okay, that at least everybody has to have access to freedom. But then he has the difference principle because not everybody is going to be able to take advantage of the opportunity. You may want to be a doctor and you just don't have that stuff. But doctors, therefore, who have the opportunity to make great wealth must apply their benefits to people beginning with the bottom. So doctors see everybody. Anyone can get on an airplane and go for a flight. So those that are best gifted and best rewarded have to be accessible to everybody else in the system. Rawls says if these two principles, the equality and the difference principle are maintained, what we're going to do is we're not going to get rid of the unlevel playing field. He believes it's going to be a little less uneven. And that's pretty obvious. There's going to be one Michael Jordan. There's going to be one Einstein. There's going to be, we're all not going to be the same. We're all not going to attain to the level that we even hope for. But at least we want the opportunity to try. Well, OK, so we've leveled the playing field a little better, but is there any other way to try and make it even fairer? Justice equals fairness. Is there any other way to make it fair? And so we come up with affirmative action. So the question for today is, or one of the questions for today is, what is affirmative action? That's a question. You get picked on. Mateo. Who's, are you eating chicken? Man, I want some, that's good chicken. Disregard that if you're watching on TV. Affirmative action is like, 
guess maybe for an example is like when somebody sees somebody doing something wrong, they go and like correct it or like fix their way of doing it to make it better for them. I guess that's my take on it. Okay, that's interesting. No wrong, just looking for answers. Affirmative action. Creating more opportunities for the less advantaged. Creating more opportunities for? The less advantaged. To the less advantaged, okay. What else is it? <coughs> Affirmative action. Hmm, I got the same response from the earlier group. I'm really surprised. Wow. I guess for me, because I work in the healthcare field, like affirmative action is like what you do to better your patients at the request of the nurse. Okay, that's a, that's interesting too. Okay, those are job performance ideas, and I like them, but they're not affirmative action. Affirmative action is an attempt to level the playing field, to make accessible opportunity, because not everybody has an equal opportunity. For instance, athletes, you now fall under Title IX, I think is what they call it, for female athletes. Female athletes got nothing when it came to any kind of assistance. Schools make billions of dollars off of male athlete sports. Women got very little of the pie, if anything. So the government passed Title IX, which was a way of trying to level the playing field and making money available. We have the WNBA right now. We never had that. We're slowly, slowly, slowly trying to expand the horizon so that opportunity is available. And we do that through something called affirmative action. So certain amounts of money, if, if schools that have male programs, they have to make certain percentage of money available for female athletes to try and level the playing field. So it's an attempt to open the door to opportunity to people who may not naturally have the opportunity. Okay, so Michael Jordan, he didn't do anything to earn his gift. What, $80 million a year, whatever it is, makes incredible amounts of money, he's very gifted. What if I'm not gifted? There's 880 men who play professional basketball and four of them, a, 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 half of them are on the practice squad. <laughs> they only get in if someone gets injured during a game maybe. They don't have the capacity, the natural talent to ascend to the highest level. But we opened the door to let them try. We had a fella here, his name is Stanley Pringle, played basketball. He had jets on the bottom of his sneakers. I'd never seen anybody dribble and run. The first day I saw him run down the court, it was like, how does he do that? And then he graduated. And then I'm watching University of Pittsburgh play some other college team, and there's this kid who's playing, and I'm looking at him thinking, boy, he looks familiar. I wish they'd foul him. He'd get on the foul line, he'd put his name down there. Stanley Pringle, and I thought, Oh, he had dreadnoughts and he cut them off evidently to play. He was number one guard at Pittsburgh, University of Pittsburgh. Just walked on the court. He's that good to be number one in college. Tried out for the pros, didn't make it. Tried out for the CBA, the Continental Basketball, didn't make it. He's back home now in the Philippines. He's playing for the Philippine national team. Making decent money, but he didn't qualify to the highest level. But at least the opportunity was there. He tried out for the pros, he tried out for the CBA and yet he couldn't ascend to the highest level. But at least the opportunity is there. So affirmative action tries to give opportunity to a broad range of people who may not either birth by talent or opportunity based on maybe socioeconomic status, at least give them opportunity to be able to maximize their talents and their skills. Does that make sense to people? Okay. So. We come up with certain questions then that try and distinguish then how do we distribute these benefits and burdens. So if you go now, when you go here, there's no, unless you're dual enrolled, there's no, there's no entrance exam. There's, you don't have to pass anything. Although we have dev ed programs because we realize in third grade, any of you know what that is? Of course you don't. Say again? No, that's a good idea, but it's not a graph. This is where the subject and the verb and the object went and the modifiers down here. This is how we learned grammar back in the day. And they don't teach that anymore. In fact, in third grade, they don't teach grammar where they should. And so by the time you get to fourth grade, the fourth grade teacher says, well, they should have taught that back here. And the fifth grade teacher says, oops, well, I'm not doing it because I have to do this. And by the time you get here, when I was in college, my very first class, Paul Shield, 
He was my professor. He worked for President John Kennedy before John got killed. I turned in a paper and I got a B plus because I misspelled one word. He said, I'm not an English teacher. Go buy a dictionary if you don't know how to spell. I'll never accept a paper that has misspelled words on it. So I bought a dictionary. And I'm a good speller. I mean, once in a while up here, I wonder if I get it right, but excellence, right? Excellence. <laughs> There's no entrance exam to come to community college. When you go to the four-year school, there will be an entrance exam. And that may be the criteria, anywhere between 3.6 and 4.0. After my first year in school, I wanted to transfer to University of California at Berkeley. You needed a 3.0 and I had a 2.98. You would think two hundredths of a point didn't mean much. It did. They wouldn't accept me. They had a standard. Once the standard is met, the door to opportunity opens. Now the question is, who should be accepted? Let's say there's 35 students and only 20 seats. Who should be accepted? Say what? The highest, the highest what? Like the highest people. These people? But the bar's set here. You know Dr. Martin Luther King, when he went to school, he wasn't that good at orator. He didn't do real well on his, on his exam. Probably the best public speaker we've ever come not in our generation anyway. But he didn't do that good at school. It wasn't until he got out of school. When I was in the military, I hated science. Any of you science people? If I had to do it over again, I'd be a biophysicist or an astrophysicist. I just, I'm in love with science, but I didn't, I didn't fall in love with it until I was in the military. I don't know how I ran it. This book was called the, the, the Philosophy of Einstein's Theory of Relativity. The math was, I mean, I had calculus in high school. It was way beyond me. But the philosophy would intrigue. I would, astrophysicists and microbiologists today, but at the time, it was useless to me. Sometimes later on in life, like Dr. King, you don't do so, but when it comes to public speaking, you become the greatest orator this country has known. So the tendency is to say, I understand that, well, the best qualified must be the highest scores. That's a theory called meritocracy. You merit the reward of your effort. Oh, by the way, in about 10 days, you're going to get your grades. Shouldn't you reward the effort of your 